I love that you both are centered on our wellness. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious how you got there. What, in just growing up, made you focus on this area? So I'll start with you, Dr. Well, you know, I started, sometimes the, the realities of life hit you hard and they hit you young. And my mother died when I was 12 years old. And so knowing what that looks like and what that feels like um, really sort of steered me in a direction of trying to figure out how to avoid those things. And being the youngest of eight kids. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I also got to see how that health played out for my older brothers and sisters. And, you know, it didn't turn out well for some of us. Mm -hmm. And so I figured there has to be a better way. You don't wait. And, you know, health is not something that, you know, um, that just befalls you. You have to actively guard it and try to keep it. Okay. Wow. Well, I could see that impact, that impact that that would have in the direction. What about you, Latham? You know, my health journey started really young. My mother was uh, pregnant with my sister when I was four years old. My great aunt was pregnant at the same time and another aunt, and they were all due within a month of each other, uh, April. March, April, May in the 1980s. And I was gonna become a, um, a big sister. And at the time I was really fascinated. So my mother, um, you know, really educated me through body literacy. I was doing coloring books, like anatomy coloring books and learning how to map the anatomy at four years old. And so for me, it was really, um, those seeds were planted very early about how to be uh, connected to the body and have a reverence for our bodies. Um, growing up in California where everything is so like health oriented, I think that also like sort of, you know, um, played a big role. And then when I became pregnant with my own son, you know, later in life, fast forward, it was um, like all of those pieces sort of that showed up as a constellation. And I was able to look back and see sort of, you know, like why the, the things that my mom taught me then would be so applicable to the work that I do today. I had a really incredible um, experience with the birth of my son, which was in a birth center with midwives. And it was that experience that also shifted me into, you know, women's health for the past two decades. And I would say that, you know, all these pieces are connected. So for me, it was that that very like early seed planted for my mother and her journey and sort of watching um, how she navigated her own pregnancies and um, and also the lessons she taught around like self-care and, and the way that she fed us and, you know, living in an environment that was so um, connected to the land and growing food and things like this. All that stuff, I think, were like just the rudiments of the seeds planted that would become our business practice later in life. Well, I've met your mom, and so I get all of that. There is no one flyer. I mean, her mother walked in this room right now. She just sh she just shuts the place down at all, at all times. You know, I am struck when you look at statistics and black women, just everything, anything that there is, we get it worse, we get it more, it's more intense. Um, how do we flip that narrative? What are the essentials? What would you say three or four essentials that black women need to do right now so that we're not at the bottom of those statistics? Well, you know, I think that there are, there's actually two questions there, um, Janine. And the first one, um, the reason why, the number one reason that we do so poorly is because we have so little access to health care. Mm. And I think if you, when, if you really want to affect the bottom line on health care disparity, you have to make sure that poor women have access to health care, that women who live in rural cities, I mean, in rural areas, or even in cities, even in Washington, D.C., it's a tale of two cities in terms of access. So there's that institutional systemic problem that has to be addressed um, because we don't have equal access to health care. And I think that the, the second part of that is that I think that women get really overwhelmed by the negativity. You know, there is, as you said, everything that comes at black women is negative. You're going to die more of breast cancer. You're going to have this. You're going to have that. I mean, the list is endless. And I think that in a lot of ways that's counterintuitive because it makes women, instead of doing more or investigating more, it makes you withdraw. Right. No. Because, you know, now you're fearful and you're not making good decisions about things. And I think that the, the one thing that there, if I had to say for women, do, if you do five things, 
exercise, eat right, don't smoke, control your blood pressure, have a, a vital and viable sense of community and activity. I mean, these are all things that will affect all aspects of your health, not just, you know, heart disease or, you know, your mental health. But, you know, these are the things that we've got to start to give positive, proactive information about how to do that, rather than come at it always from a negative point of view. No, I, I, I completely agree, and, and I try to stay in that space of, of opening yourself up to these opportunities so that you can stay in motion um, all, all the time. Um, you do so much work in maternal health. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you, through um, helping women through the doula process, kind of how does that help in this space and kind of what are your essentials, particularly for, for pregnant women? Yeah, I mean, first, I mean, we're thinking about like the maternal health crisis that we see in this country. Um, you know, to the point that was made earlier about like the negativity, I think that, you know, people, when they see these stories, um, what, it, what it signals them is that this can happen to you. And so instead of making people feel more empowered but with the information, yeah, they feel stifled or they feel like, oh, I don't think I want to be pregnant. And so and sometimes this has the, uh, the opposite effect of what we want to achieve, which is we want people to feel um, autonomy and sovereignty. We want them to feel safety in their bodies. We want them to feel connection with their providers. We want them to feel um, like they have community, right, and, and that they're not alone. And so we have to model for that. And I think care provision um, has to change in so many ways, but also within the storytelling that we have, like think about the stories that we tell each other, right? Like how important is it um, to have someone who can share with you an experience that's positive and also help you to navigate the path that you're on, right? Having people who are sort of your elders in a process that you haven't gone through yet um, really can help us model um, what's for what's possible. And I think we have to invest in uh, infrastructure and resources that actually support the health outcomes we want and actively divest in systems and in uh, institutions that are not providing the care that we desire. I think that storytelling is so important um, that you just raised and we just had an earlier conversation about menopause mm -hmm. and kind of breaking those myths and we don't talk about it. Right. Um, you know, what would you say are a couple things that people need to know about menopause that people don't talk about? You know what, the first thing that women need to understand is that if you are a person, I won't even, if you're a person and you're born with ovaries, you will go through menopause, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that is not an optional activity, you know? So it's first happening. Of, it's happening. It's happening. It's on um, its way. Okay. And, you know, <laughs> we've got to lose some of our obsession with youth um, and that, you know, we kind of walk away because menopause means certain things to certain uh, people and it's usually associated with things that are negative. I think we have to change not only the narrative of the men menopause story, but we have to show better images of what menopausal women are and what we're capable of. And it's not as if you're ready to go sit in a corner somewhere. Um, but we do have to have different expectations for menopause and what our life is gonna be like. We're going to live 30 years, if we are lucky and beyond, um, after our menopause. And so, you know, we gotta change that story and make it not be something that we run away from. Well, with that, before we wrap, I'm curious with all, you, you both have a lot of information about a lot of things that could keep you up at night, but you keep it positive. Um, what do you do for your self-care and how, what recommendation would you give to others about improving their self-care? You know what, I think that if I think what about gives me the most joy, and then that's aside from my family, that's a given, but it is the community of my girlfriends I mean, I have always been blessed to have a group of women around me that bring me joy, we support each other. Um, I think that that is the natural mode that women operate in, mm -hmm. is community. Um, and so with that, you can get through just about anything else of the hardships. Mm -hmm. And you do things that you can, you know, if you want to exercise, it's always easier to do it 
together as opposed to doing it alone. So that would be my space, my joyful space. I like that joyful space. And you do have some great girlfriends, <laughs> some awesome ones. What about you, Lethem? You know, I think that um, self-care is really about designing a life that you don't have to escape. And so what I mean by that is, you know, on a moment to moment basis, checking in with yourself to see, you know, how am I feeling in this moment? What are my needs in this moment? And actually listening and being obedient, right? And having a relationship with your body where you do listen and also affirm through action, right? So if I'm tired, I go to sleep right? I don't like stay up till two in the morning on anybody's deadline, right? And so it is healthy boundary setting. Um, it is healthy boundary setting with family members and friends. It is, um, you know, community, like was just said, was beautiful too. Um, but it's also having time for solace and respite, right? We do need time away because we do so much in our communities. We're at the crux of community. So we're also always at the office of service, right. right? And so when you think about it from that lens, um, it's critically important for us to have space for ourselves. And so for me, it's like going outside. I'm a Taurus, you know, we like to get our feet in the ground. I'm like outside in the garden. I had an amazing garden through quarantine. I was glad to be able to tend it all the time and cooking and playing music and moving my body. Like all of those things I feel like are, um, are so important for um, just my day-to-day -day recalibration. And that helps us to like really process what happens throughout our day, right? And be able to metabolize stress. And so, um, so for me, it is like not just going someplace or doing something that takes me out of the moment, but actually being in this moment and caring for myself right now. Well, I love this moment that we're in and spending this caring time with both of you. And I'm thinking about designing a life that I do not have to escape from. Like that is just, that's a big thought. <laughs> that is a big thought. Thank you ladies so, so much for all the beautiful gems. Thank you for having us. Really Thank, Thank you.